welcome to Let's Talk About Emotions. Today we're going to talk about perfectionism with Sarah Alexander, licensed social worker and uh, DEI trainer and consultant, and Sherry Olander, licensed DEI trainer and consultant and Empathy Inca Academy uh, lead instructor. So welcome. Thanks for so, so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because perfectionism, it's like the the top of the nail and then it goes so deep <laughs> right <laughs> good good metaphor <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you perfectionism for showing us where to look <laughs> where the where to dive down <laughs> yeah, exactly so perfectionism is this thing where essentially you're holding yourself to this standard of perfection which as we know is unrealistic and impossible and so we're gonna look at some of the emotions behind perfectionism today, and then just talk about like how it affects your behavior. And um, uh, we'll, just, we'll just see where it goes. So let's talk about the emotions behind perfectionism. Yay. All of them. <laughs> There's some heavy hitters, I think, but all of them are in the mix. Oh, you really think all of them? See, I mean- Well, I'm maybe all of them, yeah, be well, hmm. No, because let me rephrase that. All of them are involved, but some of them, um, when you start in on it, are um, specifically exiled. So they're like, they're part of the map, um, but they're specifically not being allowed to do their job. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk more about that. Let's name some emotions to start with. Sarah, you wanna jump in? I think it starts with shame. Yeah, shame. Um, <laughs> like shame. Yeah, well, it it tells us exactly what we're um, what contracts we've got going on, what agreements we have with ourselves, with the culture, with family, with our relationships about um, how we should behave, how we should show up, all the shoulds. Um, so it starts there. Um, and what I'm seeing over and over and over again, because I, I have the gift of being able to talk really intimately with a lot of, as a therapist, with a lot of people about this topic. And because um, one of my specialties is working with people who have eating disorders, this is like 90% of my conversations in any given week. Mm -hmm. um, that what I'm noticing, the pattern I'm noticing in addition to shame is that um, there's a, there's a, fairly predictable relationship between anger and sadness going on. In that, because the shame contract says what it says, anger is being used to protect that. And in protecting that, something is being having to be let go hmm. right and so what i'm often doing right now is is point helping people recognize that they're protecting the wrong thing and they're letting go of something important to them in the process so part of the healing is to reverse those two things mm -hmm. protect what you've been letting go and let go of what you've been protecting All right, I'm going to need a minute to kind of process that in my own mind. <laughs> it's a little light, <laughs> light consideration. <laughs> I've never looked at it that way. I want to say that that really resonates in the sense of, um, so as a fairly new parent, I became a parent three years ago. And since then, well, first I felt a lot of pressures to be a certain way as a pregnant woman. And then cool. as a new parent, I felt a lot of pressures to be like a certain way as a mother. And I really felt like there was no way that I could be a perfect mother because um, if you are perfect in one way, then you are like just not doing it right in the other way. Exactly. And it was like, there was, there was no way to win. If I was going to be all organic and green and like really super conscious, then I was going to be too crunchy for somebody. And I was, so I couldn't win according to anybody else's standards. And um, 
I just felt really like, uh, well, crappy all the time um, and uncertain of myself. One, because I was a new mom and I didn't know what I was doing. So I was, I was taking everybody else's standards on as man, like kind of trying them on. I was like, okay, well, if I do this, then maybe I can be a good mother. <laughs> but the thing is like they're through this process of trying on all these standards, I would then um, let go of things that were actually important to me, yeah. right? Hold on to the things that were not. Yes. You know? So one of the things that we are currently doing, um, and I say we, which is really nice, my husband and I are doing this together, is we're trying to get rid of plastics in our lives. Mm-hmm. And uh, one thing that happens when you have a small kid is you receive a lot of plastic stuff, mm-hmm. toys, and there's like, plastic cups and oh my god it's like there's so much stuff and so in trying to be a, you know a good parent you don't want to be that person who says oh no don't you know we'll only accept gifts like that's so pretentious we'll only accept gifts if they're made out of these things and not this thing over here and not packaged in plastic either <laughs> mm-hmm. right so how do you walk this line so um I'm just recognizing like I can't be 100% plastic free at this point. Like it's not realistic and it's not, um, it's not being kind to myself or others in our lives, right? Mm-hmm. We're appreciative. And for me, valuing my relationships with my family, with my friends is more important than setting this hard, lo- hard line and saying no plastic. Mm-hmm. So eventually that'd be nice, but um, that's just not realistic at this point right right that's a beautiful example here's the here's the anger setting boundaries and here's the sadness <laughs> right so, so the pattern i see the um it's not just that what's being protected and what's being let go are flip-flopped and need some readjustment but um that i find that when it comes to the perfectionism the the emo the primary emotion that's exiled is sadness because a perfectionist will take on all the things and not let go of anything they'll just hold themselves to a higher and higher and higher more refined status of um, shoulds. And even when they take on new information that is totally contradictory to something they've already got on board, they will try to make them both work rather than give one up. Like in eating disorders, there's this um, movement called health at every size where we take away the weight and just say, Treat your body with respect. Eat the foods that make it feel good. Move your body in a joyful manner. Um, and and uh, take care of your body without uh, requiring it that it be a certain weight. So people who have been dieting all their lives come in, they hear those that that as a possibility. They're like, yes, that's, that's in line with my feminism. That's in line with my values about other people. That's what I would tell other people. Um, I want some of that. Yes, let's sign, sign me up for that. So now they have health at every size shoulds in there. <laughs> I should treat my body with respect. Um, but they don't give up the diet mentality, which is I'm gonna treat my body with respect, but in a way that makes this weight. So now they've just like added the burden to the perfectionistic strategy of I'm gonna do all the things. Because if I do all the things, then I'll achieve happiness, the goal. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Everybody will like me. Everybody will approve of me. I will be safe, and I will be happy. That's a possibility. You know that meme? Like, I feel like I'm being attacked right now. <laughs> no, it's it's really great to hear you talk all like say all this so clearly, Sarah. I mean, obviously you've had all of this kind of um, information to to pro- how all these data points to kind of con- um, consolidate. Uh, something I was thinking about, which I was thinking about in a different way, but hearing you talk, I'm like, oh, really, it's the same thing. Um, I, I call myself a recovering perfectionist because I, oh, yeah. I very, much, very much used to be perfectionist in 
like things that I did, I would, they would absolutely have to be perfect. You know, I would like strive for perfection. Um, and you know, all that like self-loathing and everything if, if I, if I fell short and I feel like I've gotten really much better and, and to the point where good enough works, it's great. You know, like I'm just happy to get something done, but, but as we were, as I was anticipating this conversation, I was thinking about in some ways, I think I've replaced my, um, the contract with getting a specific thing done perfectly like the quality is like, well, that's fine. You can let that go as long as you do more. Like as long as you increase the quantity of things that you do, it's kind of like, I can't be a master at anything. So I'll have to be like a jack of like literally all, all the trades. trades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but but you, the way you just explained it, it, it made it seem like the same issue, just, you know, um, not necessarily making progress, just kind of turning around and looking at mm -hmm. the other side of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, I'm just